They say that C.S. Lewis's inspiration for his novel The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe came to him with a simple image of a lonely lamppost in a snowy wood, with a satyr standing under it. In one sense, the whole world of Narnia was written from the inside out around that central image. While people sometimes approach the Bible as though it were written from cover to cover, beginning to end, in many ways it's more like the world of Narnia than it is like a typical book. It too is a book that grew up, so to speak, around a central image or idea. This central image, of course, is the historical person of Jesus of Nazareth, a Jewish holy man who lived and ministered in ancient Israel between the years of 4 BC and 30 AD. He was crucified by the Roman state as a political revolutionary, and his followers believe that the third day after his execution, he rose from the dead, alive and glorified, declared in power to be the Son of God. A number of the earliest Christian writings, in fact, were written simply to tell and interpret his story. They are early biographies, so to speak, of Jesus Christ. These books are sometimes called the Gospels, and the Gospel writers were intent on setting down the historical events of his life, from what they personally witnessed or what was handed down to them through oral tradition. Of course, at the same time as these books were being written, communities of Jesus' followers, the early Christians, were springing up all over the ancient world. These were groups of men and women who worshipped and followed Jesus as the Savior, but they needed guidance and instruction to worship Him and follow Him correctly. So the apostles, church leaders who had been specially commissioned by Jesus for this job, wrote letters to these churches for specific purposes, to settle church disputes maybe to clarify teaching, perhaps, to encourage Christians who were going through persecution, and so on. These letters were circulated and recirculated around the various churches as occasion arose and opportunity allowed. After a number of generations, a bunch of these letters were in circulation, along with a number of documents telling the story of Jesus. So church leaders decided it would be a good idea to identify which writings were historical and reliable and authentic writings about Jesus, which books, that is, belonged in the canon. Of course, the Gospels and the letters only account for one-third of the actual content of the Bible. To understand where the other two-thirds came from, you need to remember that Christianity originated out of first-century Judaism. Jesus himself was a Jew, and the Jews in his day had their own set of sacred writings that described the history of God's life with Israel. Christians sometimes call these Hebrew scriptures the Old Testament, and essentially this was the Bible as it existed in Jesus' day. Jesus' message, in fact, was that as the Messiah, he was the fulfillment of the whole entire story of the Hebrew scriptures, the fulfillment of all its prophecies, the meaning of its law, and the answer to all its questions. So, because it's impossible to know who he is without knowing the story that he claimed to fulfill, Christians have always insisted that the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, are an integral part of God's Word, and that it is not complete without them. This, then, is how we got the Christian Bible. It's a book that literally grew up around the person of Jesus Christ. The writings that promised him beforehand, the writings that interpreted his life story as it happened, and the writings that teach us how to follow him now. Or, as Jesus himself said it in one place, these were written to testify about me.